Okay, morning everybody. Uh, let's dive in. We are going to finish the last slide in lecture 10 today, finish our discussion of uh, minimal cognitive, uh, sorry, we're going to finish the last lecture, last slide in lecture 9. We've almost finished minimal cognition, and then we'll spend most of today talking about active categorical perception. And every year around this time when we switch topics and switch to legged locomotion, I always hope for an icy day. And we're in luck this year. So uh, thinking about thinking is misleading. Legged locomotion is trivial. It's no problem to keep about 100 pounds or so balanced on two stilts. Uh, today, however, we're reminded that it is not a trivial thing to do. So we'll talk today towards the end of class. Uh, we'll start to talk about the intimate relationship between self-movement and uh, intelligence. So do be careful out there today. Any questions about the assignments? All good? Okay, so uh, as you'll recall, last time we were looking at four different experiments that were designed to evolve relatively simple agents that regardless exhibit the beginnings of some of the building blocks of intelligence, right? You can view these as physical Turing tests. And we ended last time with the fourth and most challenging uh, of the four. Why is it challenging? Because it's particularly difficult to evolve an agent to do this. We haven't really talked about the evolutionary algorithm in these experiments, but as you can imagine, evolving an agent to perform selective attention takes a fair bit of more computational effort for the evolutionary algorithm than the other three. And the reason why is that an agent has to be able to solve two different, at least two different problems simultaneously. It has to observe or actively, it has to interact with these two objects and determine whether the one that is currently further away is going to, given its higher velocity, pass the closest one and land first, in which case the agent should select to attend to that one and go chase after it first. But in the process of chasing after it, if it loses sight of the other one, it needs to somehow remember where it is and go chase after it and capture it. So we're gonna look at, uh, as usual, we're gonna look at one evolved CTRNN. And in this case, we're gonna evolve, uh, we're gonna play back that CTRNN in the agent five times. And in each of these five trials, after evolution has finished, we're going to make the environment more difficult. So we'll start with the simplest environment up here, in which case there is no passing objects. The objects do not pass one another. And the objects never pass outside the view of, uh, neither object passes outside the view of the agent. Okay, so as usual, takes a little bit to parse these figures and sort of quote unquote get the figure and figure out how it's showing us what the agent is doing. Let's start with the simplest elements of these figures. What do the two straight lines represent? Would you guess? The trajectories of the falling objects. The trajectories of the falling objects, right? So we have these pairs of objects that are falling. They're falling at different velocities. So we have time, this is kind of odd, we have time going down on the vertical axis. So we start with the objects, they start falling, and at this particular point in time, this is when the first object hits the ground, and then some short time later, further to the right, so the horizontal axis is left and right, uh, is left and right. Some short time later, the second object hits the ground. What is the squiggly black line representing? The motion of the robot, right? So you can see the robot moving back and forth underneath the object that is going to hit first. So that's good news. And the agent happens to be there when that happens. And then the agent immediately moves to the right, gets underneath the second object, which is falling at a slower velocity, and tracks back and forth under that agent, uh, under, uh, under that object, and captures it successfully. What do the shaded parallelograms represent, or the polygons here? Field of view. The field of view, right? So you can see that uh, the lighter polygon here, the agent has these beams that are going up. It's able to see uh, the first object, and then the darker polygon 
is overlapping the second straight line showing that the robot at least sees this second object. Yeah? Okay. Let's replay the same C to an N, but in a slightly different, uh, slightly more difficult environment. In this case, the object that is originally further away from the agent is moving faster. So as both objects are falling, that faster object uh, eventually passes the slower object, and now the robot has to go after that object. And the dashed line, as you can imagine, is the point in time at which the two objects cross. When does the agent figure out which object is going to hit the ground first? As usual, it's not, it's not very clear, right? Remember that this is the same C to an N. So over here in the easier environment, it's, it's underneath the object that's going to hit first. At this point, before the objects have passed one another, it's kind of moving slowly between the two objects. And you'll notice that both shaded polygons overlap uh, both of these straight lines, meaning the robot can see both objects at the same time. It's moving back and forth. The objects pass one another. The agent is still moving back and forth underneath, between both of them, underneath and between both of them and then slowly gets underneath this one and captures it. And then similarly to over here, it goes chasing after the second one and captures it. So again, it's not clear when it makes this decision, let alone how it makes the decision, but there is definitely different behavior here compared to over here, right? So the agent is doing something to determine which of these two objects is going to hit first. Let's make things more difficult. Uh, yes? Is the robot able to distinguish that there are two balls? So when they overlap each other, does it now think there's only one ball and separate now it's a whole new instance where we're looking at two new balls? That's a great question, right? So can the agent see both objects and what happens when the objects are overlapping? The answer is the robot does not see uh, objects at all. All it sees are broken beams, right? It's getting these seven or nine numbers in this case back at every point in time. How it interprets that is not clear. If, in the rare case that both objects perfectly overlap, the, object, the robot, in theory, does, is not able to distinguish between that and a single object. But this CTRNN does have recurrent connections. So it may remember that this is what it saw at the previous time step, and this is what it sees at the moment. Right? Now, whether the CTRNN evolved to take advantage of that information, it's not clear at this point. Okay, so let's look in this third environment. In this case, we're gonna look at the inverted case. We do not have objects that pass one another, but we are going to expose the robot to the object permanence problem. How do we do that? Well, we have two objects that are falling away from one another, right? If we look at the two straight lines, the object that's initially on the right ends up falling far to the left, hitting far to the left, and the object that was originally to the left hits uh, at the bottom of the screen to, uh, to the right of the screen. What happens in this case? What does the agent do? Yep. The agent has some sense of speed, so the moment it gets on the second object, it starts to move. Exactly. So at this point in time, unlike the similar, like the previous situations we looked at, it's tracking back and forth underneath the object, which quote unquote it knows is going to hit first. Right? It is clearly quote unquote made a decision and is going after the correct object, the one that's going to hit first. And the moment that that object hits, you'll notice now that uh, the other straight line, this one. The, ob the, the, uh, the robot is outside, it cannot see that second object, right? It immediately starts moving very quickly, so you can see this is a almost horizontal line, We're moving, it's moving relatively quickly in the correct decision, uh, in the correct direction. So we know that the agent knows at least on what side the object is on, and the fact that it's moving so quickly means it probably quote unquote knows the object is not just over to its left, but every moment that the agent stalls, 
the object is going to be even further to its left. So this agent is hustling, maybe not as fast as it can, but pretty quickly to go grab the object, gets there a little bit early, and tracks back and forth underneath and captures the second object. Not bad. Okay, let's make things really hard on the CTRNN. We're going to have two objects that pass one another. And we're going to create the object permanence problem. These objects are going to fall uh, in opposite directions. What does the agent do in this case? Yep. Yep. So same as before, right? So it's sort of combining its solutions from these two sub problems. So it deals with the passing objects problem first. It watches both of them. And once they've passed, it starts heading towards the one that's going to hit first. And then again, moves relatively quickly and gets there just in time to capture the second falling object. So as you mentioned, it's sitting between the two and it's watching. So possibly evolution has discovered the easier solution here, which is that the agent doesn't need to decide before the objects pass, which is going to hit first. It just waits and watches. And once the faster moving object is closer, it goes after that one. So that means that if the object's moving at very unpredictable speeds, it will probably or likely fail because what if, maybe this is a whimsical extension, but what if the object one slows down or something? So I'm just trying to show how, how specific this problem is. I mean, how specific the CTRN is to a very specific problem. That's a great, that's a great point, right? So this CTRN, it's general to these five conditions, but as you mentioned, we've built in lots of assumptions, like for example, uh, the agents, or the objects always have a constant velocity. What if they can accelerate and decelerate? So now we assume the objects do no, no longer have a constant velocity. Remember that in the early days of uh, evolutionary robotics here, in the minimal cognition literature, they were trying to strip everything down to be as simple as possible. And the idea would be that then they would go back and try and relax some of these assumptions, as you mentioned. Once we have a simple agent that can solve a problem, Let's try and incrementally make the problem harder. Even in this little micro case here where we're scaling up the difficulty of the problem within these simplified constraints, constant velocity. This is a very, very different approach from a lot of what you see in robotics today where we take a humanoid robot or a very complex drone and feed it as much data as Google can collect and train the heck out of that machine and hope for the best, right? So one of the things that at least appeals to me about evolutionary robotics is the idea of start simple, right? That's how mother nature got to us, didn't start with humans. Start simple, have a minimal agent that can do okay, that can satisfy the conditions in its admittedly simplified environment, and then incrementally challenge those evolving populations of simple agents to become increasingly complex. It's part of the reason why we're spending so much time looking at the minimal cognition uh, experiments. Right? So of course, this is overly simplified. There's no way that this evolved CTRNN is going to be able to deal with more realistic situations. But we could potentially expose it and other members of its population to slightly more complex and challenging environments and more realistic environments and continuously evolve up to something that's more realistic and useful. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at uh, the most difficult situation. So again, same C tier and N. We are, gonna we are gonna have the passing objects problem and the object permanence problem. Why is this case more difficult from this case? What is it about it that makes it more difficult? It, it, uh, it does see the second object falling. It would have to, because it's gotta, once it captures the first one, it has to know what direction to head in. There's no overlap in the field of view. There is maybe right at the beginning, right? The first few time steps of the simulation. It's not very long. The robot can see both, but that challenges it to decide, quote unquote, decide very quickly which object is going to hit first, right? And you can see that this CTRNN is able to rise to the challenge. 
even though it's just seen these objects for a, a blink of an eye, it immediately starts heading for the object, which above this dashed line, that object is actually further away than this object. But the agent has already figured out which one is going to hit first, tracks it, and then, as always, remembers where the other one is and where it's going to hit and gets there just in time to capture the second object. Any questions about that? Any questions about minimal cognition before we move on? Yes? How does the agent determine the speed? Ah, how, does, how does the agent determine the speed, right? So it has to somehow, because the light, this object is further away, so it has to not only compute the velocities of these two objects, but the difference in velocities, which is traveling faster. Given this, and given what you know about CTRNNs, how does it know the velocity? Absolutely, right? The definition of velocity is change in distance over time. Right? So this agent, in this case, is going to have to remember. There is no alternative. Right? It has to use the broken beams at time t, the length of the broken beams at time t, remember that somehow, and then see the length of the broken beams at the next time step and combine that information in some way that influences the motors that results in it chasing after the one that's moving faster. Just curious, considering that CTRNs revolve around changing the derivative of the neuron time as opposed yep. to the actual value, could that somehow be leveraged to compute the fact that derivative is a, I mean, sorry, the velocity derivative of position? Ah, uh, possibly. So the CTRNs themselves obviously are ordinary differential equations. They are also computing a difference over time. But that's different from the movement of the of the objects, right? They need they need to be able to see change in sensory input. They need to use that somehow. OK. Any other questions before we move on? OK. So we looked at four, uh, four aspects of cognition in lecture nine. Um, we're going to look at a fifth one now. And this one is even more difficult than the selective attention task that we looked at. And as I just mentioned, we're now going to start in this last lecture in this segment, we're going to move away from minimal agents to a slightly less minimal agent. We're going to look at an agent that's a little bit more complex and is able to deal with more complex situations. And uh, before I introduce that, uh, that agent, however, let's talk about uh, ACP, Active Categorical Perception. This is, uh, again, one of the best examples, I think, in this course of this concept of embodied cognition pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back as one strategy for developing intelligence versus the passive approach to AI, which is to have a deep neural network sit quietly and wait for millions of images or YouTube videos to be supplied to it from an investigator. What is the advantage of being active? How does an agent that's active benefit over one that's passive. We've seen examples of this before. Here's another riff on this theme. You are an active agent. You are curious. You push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Let's imagine that I was to sit you down at a table and blindfold you and one after the other put these 11 objects in front of you and give you the following instructions. You need to place uh, your flat palm, your, ha your hand palm down on the top of this object. You're blindfolded, so you can't blindfolded, you can't see the object. And then I want you to move your hand back and forth. So I'm sort of telling you how to interact with these objects. Let's so imagine you were to do that with each of these 11 objects, one after the other, on a regular flat tabletop. What would happen? Uh, let's imagine they're 3D objects, but they have the same cross section. So this is a cylinder. It's like a puck. It's like a puck. Yeah, exactly. And this is a long uh, rectangular cube. Yeah. Doesn't matter too much, but 
What would happen if you were interacting with this object in the way I just mentioned? Wait, is there like long enough that you can tell there's somebody with both? Could, could the baby be lying like on the edge or on the face? They're lying uh, facing you. So imagine you are sitting at the table, and if you were to take off the blindfold, this is what you would see. So you're placing your hand, in the case of the first object, like this, and then you're moving your palm back and forth. What's going to happen? A certain number of them would roll. A certain number of them would roll, and a certain number of them would, no, would, slide. would slide, right? So. These 11 objects, if you interact with them in a certain way, are going to project certain affordances, or you're going to feel a certain interaction. Some of these, given the table, given the, the orientation that we're placing the object, given the fact that you're blindfolded, uh, given the amount of sweat that's on your palm, given a hundred other details, some of these objects are going to be rollable, and some of them are going to be slideable. Right? The geometry, however, is continuous, right? If I were to ask you to put, to cut somewhere along this sequence of 11 objects and everything to the left of the line is a cylinder and everything to the right is an, is an edged object, where would you place that line? It's an ill-formed question, right? There is no real distinguishing point. However, the moment you interact with these objects, something magical happens which is categories appear, Roll, rollable and slideable, right? Categ being, being able to recognize categories in the world is clearly a very important aspect of intelligence. Our distant ancestors need to, needed to distinguish between friend and foe, food and poison, poison dangerous situations and situations with opportunity, so you can think of a million examples. Categorization is very important. Where do categories come from in the world? This is something that philosophers have argued about for thousands of years. For someone in the school of embodied cognition, categories come about, they arise from the interaction of the agent with its environment. They are not inherent in the objects themselves. A chair is not a chair just because of its geometry. It is a chair because of the ways you may be able to interact with it. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, I told you how to interact with these objects, but as an intelligent agent, you can also choose how to interact with these objects to generate your own categories, thing, categories that are relevant to you. Maybe distinguishing between rollable and slideable objects is not that interesting to you or important for your survival. You may interact with objects in other ways that generates categories in those objects that are relevant. So what we're gonna look at in a moment is an agent where we do not tell it how to interact with the objects. It is going to, through an evolutionary algorithm, discover its own ways of interacting with these objects to bring out uh, categories. By choosing, how, what, what are we looking for? What is the interaction that we're looking for? We're looking for an, an interaction that will reduce within category differences. So as you slide your palm along the top of these objects, obje obviously these objects are uh, similar but also different terms of their geometry, and you're going to have slightly different interactions with them, but they are all going to roll. Some of those differences are going to disappear given the fact that you've chosen to press your palm on the top and move your arm back and forth. Same thing with the edged objects. They're all slightly different, but you're reducing their within category differences in the fact that they, they all slide. right? You can also, if you're really clever, pick a way to interact with objects where you magnify between category differences. Yeah? Okay, we'll, we'll see that uh, in a moment. So let's have a look at the agent now. Clearly, uh, it is not minimal. We're going to work today with uh, an anthropomorphic robotic arm. So anthro is human, pomorphic of the shape of. So this is a somewhat human-shaped robot. Um, it is not human-shaped in the fact that it only has one arm and nothing else. 
Inside this arm, you'll notice J1 through J7. So it has seven rotational joints, not unlike what you're doing in PyroSim, and a whole bunch of rotational joints uh, in, the, in the fingers and thumbs. We'll talk about the sensors uh, in a moment. What is this uh, agent going to be evolved to do? Well, we're going to take a CTRNN, and we'll see the CTRNN in a moment. We're going to drop it into this robot 16 times and compute the fitness or the average performance of that CTRNN across those 16 trials. We're going to do eight trials where the robot's arm starts in position A and then starts moving. Another eight trials when the arm is in position B. And in both positions, we have eight trials where we're going to place either a sphere underneath the robot's palm or an ellipsoid. In the bottom row here, four of the eight trials is we're going to place that ellipsoid at four different orientations, initial orientations, underneath the robot's palm. And we're going to do the same thing with the sphere, but of course rotation of the sphere doesn't give us any difference, right? What, we, what we are going to evolve the robot to do is tell us what object is underneath its palm. We can see pretty easily by looking at this picture which is the ellipsoid and which is the sphere. The robot is blindfolded. It doesn't have a video camera. It's not going to be able to see these objects. It is only going to be able to feel the way in which its arm interacts with the thing that's underneath its palm. Yeah. So, kind of a, still a minimal task. We're going to categorize just between two uh, shapes. The, but the shapes are pretty close to one another. And there's going to be some pretty complicated sensory data that the robot is, is getting back. There's no easy way for the robot to immediately measure the major and minor axes of the object under its palm and determine if the length of those two axes is equal. It's the sphere the length of those two axes is different, it's the ellipsoid. It's not an easy thing to do. We're making things hard on the robot here. Okay. So that's the robot's body. Let's have a look at its brain, its CTRNN. Let's have a look at the picture first and then we'll tackle the math uh, underneath. In the bottom row, we have uh, all of the sensor neurons. So this robot has 22 sensors. The first seven are proprioceptive sensors, and those live on the seven joints. So when the joints rotate, those sensors return the angle of that rotation. The next uh, 10 are tactile sensors, and those 10 are placed at the 10 positions in the hand, as we can see here. One in the, th one in the palm, the second one at the tip of the thumb, and the rest distributed throughout the fingers. Uh, and then the last five input neurons are the hand proprioceptive sensors, which are not on this figure here, but as you can imagine, they're giving back the angle of each of the five fingers. Yeah? So the robot can feel its arm moving, its hand moving, and it can feel whether or not something is touching various points on the undersurface of its hand. Those 22 incoming signals arrive at the, these 22 input neurons and they then flow into the hidden layer. They call them internal neurons here, but that's the uh, same thing as hidden neurons. What does this little curved arrow here remind us of? Feedback, right? So these are recurrent connections. So we immediately know that this CTRNN is capable of memory, if that's useful. These, uh, these eight hidden neurons then flow out to 18 output neurons. The first 14 are actuators to the arms. So we have 14 motor neurons that are assigned to seven joints, which seems kind of strange. You would expect seven motor neurons assigned to seven joints. As I mentioned, this robot is anthropomorphic meaning that they're trying to build into this robot certain details of human, in this case, human uh, physiology. Why two motor neurons per joint? What is the detail of human anatomy they're trying to get right here? Yes? 
Exactly, right? So this is known as agonist and, and agonist and antagonistic muscle groupings. So uh, you can play this game at home. You can try and not use one of those muscle groups. So extend your bicep, and unless you let gravity do the work for you, you cannot extend your lower arm. So again, you're not aware of it most of the time, but you are basically a series of pulleys, right? Pull on one side of a bone, and you'll get this. Pull on the other side with the antagonistic group, and your arm will extend, right? So of course, we really only need to send one number to the joint, which is the, des or to the, the motor associated with the joint, which is the desired angle. So in this case, they just take pairs of neurons, take the difference between those two numbers and send that as the desired uh, angle. Okay, if we were to build this robot in reality, we could imagine adding uh, actuated springs on either side of a motorized joint of a joint and pulling or compressing I either the agonist spring or the antagonistic spring. So they're kind of laying the groundwork for turning this robot into a real robot someday. Okay. Only two actuators for the hand. Uh, so as you can see, this robot is starting to get pretty complicated. So in this case, um, they're going to use just one agonist and antagonistic motor neuron for the hand, which pulls or uh, which closes or opens the robot's hand. It cannot independently actuate the fingers. So a little bit of an approximation here. That brings us to neuron number 47 and 48, which are the categorization neurons. We are going to use these to, uh, the robot is going to use these to tell us whether it thinks that it is in contact with a sphere or an ellipsoid. Yes? How is this handle like two, say the muscle, yep. on, on either side of the same bone? Yep. Trying to pull it. Because like when you, if you try to move your arm, you can't like pull with you absolutely can. You can you can tense both agonist and antagonistic muscle groups. If you lift a heavy jug of liquid, that's exactly what you're doing. You're holding your arm constant and resisting any external force on on your arm in that case. Same thing here. So imagine we take uh, the elbow joint, for example, in the arm, and the two motor neurons associated with that elbow joint send exactly the same number. We take the difference between those two numbers, which is zero, and the command arriving at the motor at the elbow says, keep the angle at zero, in which case this robot will attempt, depending on how strong the motor is at the elbow, to hold the angle of the elbow constant, regardless of the external forces that are acting on the arm, including in this case, or maybe only gravity in this case. Make sense? That's another actually advantage of the agonist antagonistic uh, muscle system. You can re actively resist and hold a pose constant, which may or may not be useful to the robot here. Make sense? Okay. So back to the categorization uh, neurons. The robot doesn't have speech. It's not going to tell us. We're going to look at neurons 47 and 48. If the value of 47 is greater than the value of 48, at a given point in time, that's the robot saying sphere, 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 sphere. If 48, the value of 48 is greater than the value of 47, that's the robot saying, uh, the robot saying ellipsoid, 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 ellipsoid. We could do it that way, which would seem to be the simplest way to do it. We have one categorization neuron for spheres and another categorization neuron for ellipsoids. Seems reasonable. It's probably how you do it, right? You have one neuron for coffee mug, pen, another for paper, another one for chair, another one for your maternal grandmother, another one for your paternal grandmother. Make sense? Seems reasonable, right? Must obviously be the way we do it. Thank you. All right. We're just, you're going to get tired of this before, before the end, right? Who knows how many categories you recognize that are, re again, relevant to you, but it's a whole lot. And we have a lot, a lot of neurons. 
One of the longest running and most acrimonious debates in neuroscience that has been raging for decades is centered around the grandmother neuron. That you have one neuron for your grandmother. Whenever you see your grandmother, think about your grandmother, receive a card from your grandmother, that neuron lights up. Right? And another one for, and another one for, and another one for, because that seems the simplest way to do things, and so it must obviously be true. As you can imagine, there is another camp that says, uh-uh, it's probably not that. So let's explore alternatives which are less intuitive, but have an advantage. And as you can imagine, the authors of this paper come from that other camp, and these two neurons, whatever they're doing, we're going to talk about them in a moment, do not simply indicate ellipse or sphere, because we would need to add, for this robot, we would add, need to add a 49th neuron if we started to expose it to cubes, and a 50th one if we started to excuse, uh, expose it to objects that move on their own account, Another one for grapes, another one for bananas, another one for apples, another one for... And we're trapped, right? On and on we go. Is there a way that we could encode more than two categories in just these two neurons? So as you're going to see in a moment, that's what they're going to try and do. They're going to read out these two neurons in a way that allows the robot to learn and express to us which of these categories the current object belongs to, even if there's more than two categories. That approach arguably may be more scalable than adding more neural real estate for every new concept or new thing that you need to tackle. Okay, so let's switch to the math now. Um, we have 48 neurons in our CTRNN, so we know that we have 48 ordinary differential equations where each one represents how the value of that neuron changes over time. The first 22 differential equations have this form, and the 23rd through the 48th differential equation have this form, yeah? which should be somewhat recognizable to you. Let's start with the first 22. Tell me about how the values of the first 22 neurons change over time. What, is this, what does this differential equation tell you? There should be some recognizable elements here. We've got the tau sub i's, right? So each of these 22 neurons, assuming evolution is altering the tau's, which it is, these neurons can respond to the input coming from uppercase i sub i in what way? How does tinkering with the taus in these input neurons change their behavior? Yep. It slows, them or it slows or speeds them, right? So actually, maybe we should have started with this term. We know that uppercase i sub i is the actual value coming from one of the 22 sensors, right? We have the seven proprioceptive sensors. So we have 22 sensors, and we have these 22 input neurons, each of which is receiving a signal from one of those, one of those sensors. The ith input neuron is receiving input from the ith uh, sensor. Yeah. The rate at which those 22 input neurons change their value in response to the incoming signal is altered by tau. We have our minus y sub i, which again, is if the sensor is quiet, the input neuron will gradually decay back to, in this case, zero, because there's nothing else affecting it. What about the g here? I think actually this is a mistake. I think this should be g sub i. Let's assume for today's discussion that it is g sub i. the weight of the sensor on that input neuron, right? So if evolution tunes one of the input neurons g sub i down to zero, that neuron, basically evolution is turning off that sensor. That sensor is no longer going to influence that input neuron and therefore nothing else in the neural network, right? So the investigators made these 22 sensors available to the robot, but maybe not all of them are useful. So they provided a mechanism for evolution to turn them off. 
or maybe turn some of them up, increase their, their influence. Okay, the remaining hidden neurons and motor neurons, uh, they change their value according to this differential equation. What's missing from when we talked about CTRNNs before? There's also this beta, which we didn't see before. It was theta before, good, good eye. What, what's theta? What was theta? Or what is beta? It's the, bi the bias, right? B for, for bias in this case, maybe a better choice of notation here. So evolution can bias certain neurons to always be positive or always be negative, or at least decay back towards those default values if nothing else is going on. The, the double subscript on the Ws should remind you again, those are the weights, right? That one's pretty straightforward. And we got our activation function. So pretty, pretty familiar. Yeah? Okay. Let's talk about neurons 47 and 48. How are we going to get the robot to tell us which of the two categories for the moment an object belongs to? We're going to treat the values that are arriving at the 47th and 48th neuron uh, as obviously values that are changing over time. And we're going to take those two changing values and draw them in a two-dimensional plane. So you can imagine, if you want, the robot, instead of telling us which object it's currently experiencing, it's going to draw it for us. So on the horizontal axis here, we're going to plot the value of the 47th neuron. And on the vertical axis, we're going to plot the value of the 48th neuron. And we're going to start, we'll talk about time in a moment, but at some point in time, we are going to read out the current value of neurons 47 and 48. And we're going to treat those two values as coordinates in the two-dimensional plane here. It seems like kind of an odd thing to do, but bear with me for a moment. At the next time step in the simulation, the robot is interacting with the object, something is happening, and the values of the 47th and 48th neuron, we integrate those differential equations, and those values change slightly. So we have two new values for 47 and 48, which we're again treating as co coordinates in the two-dimensional plane. And as time marches forward in this single evaluation, one of the 16 trials, these two values are changing over time. And if we simply connect the dots, we get a trajectory that is moving through time. So we are drawing the way in which the values of these two neurons are changing over time. And this is known, if you haven't seen this before, as a phase diagram. Uh, this is a popular way uh, in uh, mathematics of visually representing uh, things that change over time, M multiple things that change over time. If we had three variables, 47, 48, and 49, we would get, again, a trajectory that's moving through three dimensions, right? We'd get, we'd get and, and so on and so forth. So we're going to stick, or the investigator is stuck with two for a very obvious reason, which is it's easy for us to draw things in two dimensions. Okay, let's imagine, uh, uh, sorry, let's add another detail here. We are going to actually only draw this diagram from a certain time period, which is 0 0.95, 0 0.95 uppercase T, where uppercase T represents how long we're gonna run the simulation for. So an uppercase T of five means we're gonna run this for five seconds. An uppercase T of 100 means we're gonna run it for 100 seconds. So 0.95 T, if the current value of T, lowercase T, is at 0.95 T, that means we are 95% of the way through the current evaluation period. So the robot has been manipulating the object for a while, and then we are just watching this trajectory between 0.95 T and T, just the last 5% of its evaluation period. Remember that we're going to use this trajectory, or we're going to interpret this trajectory as the robot telling us 
which of the two objects it's in contact with. So we want to give it some time to explore, maybe fumble, do some exploratory actions. Not unlike the agent we just saw in the previous lecture that was actively scanning underneath the falling object. You might need some time to play with an object to figure out what it is. So we'll give it between 0 and 0.95 t to do what it needs to do. And then we want it to tell us, using the changing values of 47 and 48, what it is. So far, so good? OK, I'm just going to remove this for a moment. OK. Now, what, what are we going to do? Let's introduce a little bit of notation. We're going to uh, use lowercase e to represent the eth evaluation. Remember that we have 16. So an e equals 1 is the first of the 16 evaluation trials. An e equals 16 is the 16th evaluation trial, uh, and so on. We're going to use uppercase s and uppercase d to represent the sphere and the ellipsoid. And we are going to associate, if the robot is in contact, for example, with the sphere, it doesn't know that it is, right, yet. We are going to associate with that a rectangle, and that rectangle is the, re the bounding box that we're going to place around the trajectory. So the robot experiences some unknown object. We know it's the sphere. It does its thing. It produces this trajectory in the last fraction of the eth uh, trial here. And we're going to then place a bounding box around this trajectory by taking the lowest value of 47 in this period. We're going to look at all these values. What was the minimum value of 47? We're going to look at what was the minimum value of 48 during this period. And it's also about here. We're then going to look for the maximum value of 47 in this trajectory. And finally, the maximum value of 48 in this trajectory. And we get a bounding box around the sphere. And we're going to refer to this as R uh, sub S E. So this is the rectangle around uh, the E at R sub E uh, sub S E. So we're going to place a rectangle around the sphere that was exposed to the robot during the E -th trial. Again, seems like kind of an odd thing to do, but bear with us. So far, so good? OK. Take the same C tier and N. We put the arm back to either position A or position B. We pick another one of these objects and an orientation, put it underneath the robot's hand. And the same C tier and N is allowed to control the robot. And in this case, we've exposed it to an ellipsoid, which again, the robot doesn't know. And it describes a different trajectory. So for, it interacts with those object, that object in some other way, produces a different trajectory. And we draw a bounding box around that and call it R sub D, lowercase e, the rectangle around the ellipsoid presented during this trial. And at the end, we're going to have uh, 16 rectangles in the plane, eight of them corresponding to when the robot was exposed to the sphere, the other eight when the robot was exposed to the ellipsoid. Final thing, we are going to then draw an overall bounding box. Let's assume I, I'm not going to draw all 16. Let's say I have a second bounding box for a second sphere here and a second bounding box for a second ellipsoid presentation here. We're going to take C sub S and define it as the bounding box that contains all of the trajectories produced by the robot when it was exposed to the sphere. That's C sub S. This overall bounding box is going to represent the category for sphere for this C tier and N. We're going to take a second bounding box and put it around all the bounding boxes associated with the presentations of ellipsoids. And we're going to call that bounding box the category according to the robot for the ellipsoids. So far, so good. In this cartoon example here, how well is the robot doing at distinguishing between spheres and ellipsoids? There's only a little overlap. So it's doing pretty well, right? If it drew, if we put 
spheres or ellipsoids in front of it and the robot always did exactly the same thing in all 16 cases, what would this picture look like? What would we get? Tell me about the trajectories. The robot does exactly the same thing in all 16 trials. You get complete overlap, right? We get 16 identical trajectories, giving us 16 identical bounding boxes, giving us identical CD and CS Uber bounding boxes, and the robot can't distinguish between these two categories. In this cartoon example here, it's doing pretty well, but there's a little bit of overlap here. Let's imagine that we took a ninth object, which could be either the ellipsoid or the sphere, but the robot doesn't know, and we put it in front of the robot and it, and it traces a 17th trajectory which sits and lives inside of this overlapping region. What is the robot telling us about that uh, 17th object from its point of view? It's confused. It says, I don't know. Could be either, right? Okay, so you might have been able to figure out where this is going. We are now going to evolve the 48 taus and the 48, is it 48? Yeah. The 48 taus and the 48, uh, the 48 by 48 <laughs> weight matrix. We're going to evolve C tier and Ns, and we're going to select for those that produces the, the following performance. Our fitness function is going to combine two fitness terms. So let's tackle F1 first. We can see on the outside here, we're gonna take the average over uh, uppercase E trials, which in this case is the 16. So we're gonna expose the robot to 16 uh, trials. We're gonna take the average performance, and we're gonna compute in each of these 16 cases D sub E, which is the Euclidean distance between the object and the robot and the center of the robot's palm. So a robot that pulls its hand far away from the object is gonna have a large D sub E, and a robot that keeps its palm in contact with the object is gonna have a D sub E near zero. What does F1 select for? Imagine we just used FF equals F1, forget F2 for a moment. We evolved, and I played you back the video of the best CTRNN. What would you expect to see the robot doing? Go towards the object. Let's be a little more specific. Just keep its palm in contact with the object, right? So what we're really doing by introducing this first fitness term is giving the robot a little bit of a hint. You, you, you only have proprioceptive sensors. You don't have a camera, you're blind. So if you do this, you're gonna have a pretty hard time being able to distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids, right? You can imagine they probably put that in because if you, most random CTRNNs are not gonna keep the palm in contact with the, with the object. The arm's gonna be swinging wildly and randomly all over the place. So basically, they're acting like a parent here and saying, I'm not gonna tell you how to solve the problem, but in order to solve the problem, you need to keep in contact with the object. We've seen this idea of scaffolding the evolution of behavior before, starting with a simpler fitness function and making it more difficult. Where have we seen that before? Anybody remember? If you remember back to the gantry robot that was trying to distinguish between triangles and rectangles at the bottom underneath the table, they started by just go towards the black and then distinguish between shapes. So common scaffolding is a common uh, hack in uh, this field of robotics. Okay, let's focus on F2, which is a little more uh, interesting. If F1 is less than one, you get nothing for F2. What does that mean? There's an if statement in this fitness function, which we, hasn't, we haven't seen before. When the hand's not in constant contact with the object, do I just worry about F2? Yep, exactly. So if you're not keeping your hand in contact with the object, even if you're starting to get good at the task, you don't get any 
reward for it. It's all, all of F2 is thrown away until you're able to keep uh, your hand in contact with the object in all 16 trials. Okay. Let's dive in. So we've got C sub S and C sub D. We're taking the area of the intersection, this area, and we're taking one minus that, the area of intersection. What does that tell you? What is evolution trying to do with C sub S and C sub D? Go ahead. Yep. Trying to reduce the intersection. Exactly, right? This, this is the magic right here, right? Minimize your confusion about your experiences with these objects. So we're selecting for this area of overlap to be zero. We are normalizing it by the minimum of the area. We're normalizing it by the minimum of the area of uh, the smaller of the two. Seems kind of odd. Why, why do we need to do this normalization? Who cares? We just select. We've got a population of these C tier and Ns, and the one that has the smallest overlap wins. Um, let's try to make sure that it doesn't just make the areas like as small as possible. But it be really There's nothing in the fitness function that says anything about the size of C sub S or C sub D. So imagine this is the situation for one C tier and N in the population. In this population, there is another C tier and N that draws this. C sub S and this C sub D. So two very small uh, uber bounding boxes that are almost completely in overlap, but has a smaller area of intersection than this one. This one, this C tier and N could drive this C tier and N and its descendants to extinction in the population, right? Which is not what we want. So it's really the percent of overlap relative to the areas of these two objects that we're looking for. Make sense? Okay, so now we get to the fun part, the videos. We are uh, again going to watch uh, one C tier and N that is repeatedly exposed to different objects. I'll play the video on the top left first. Um, and you can see that in that video, the arm starts in, in position A, and in the second video, it's going to start in position B. Can everybody see the red and the blue and the green in the lower left of the upper left panel? Kind of? Okay. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I can, maybe I can maximize this. I don't know if this, uh, oh yeah, I can. Great. Okay. Now it's down to the lower left, but hopefully you can see. A little bit better? <laughs> okay. Good point. If I know how to turn the lights off. Ah, I do. How's that? Much better. Okay. So um, you can see that at this point in time, which is T0, not surprisingly, the C tier and N does not know whether it's in contact with a sphere or an ellipsoid. And you can see uh, this uncertainty is represented by the blue arrow, which is pointing directly up. How do we go from this, which is what's really happening, to figuring out whether the arrow is up and to the left, or sorry, is, is uh, vertical, and once I start this video, you'll see that this arrow is going to start to jump around between vertical, pointing to the left, or pointing to the right. What does that mean? How do we get from that to the direction of the blue arrow? It, it, more sure that it's in, right? So it, we're, remember that we're going to start, or the robot is going to trace a trajectory in this two-dimensional plane. So at any point in time, we have a point on that trajectory. If the point is in C sub S, then the arrow is going to point to the left. If the arrow is in uh, C sub D, it's going to point to the right. And the arrow is going to point up when... <coughs> in the intersection or outside either box, right? Okay.
How did the robot do? Did it get it right in all eight cases? Hands up if you think it was right in all eight cases. Was it right in seven out of eight cases? Six out of eight cases? Five, four. It's hard to tell, right? So the trick here is you're performing active categorical perception while this is occurring, right? Your eyes are saccading around the hand and around the unknown object. There's nothing on this video that tells you whether that's actually a sphere or an ellipsoid. And this is also hard on you because you're also trying to parse what's going on in the bottom left. So your eye is saccading down there and you're also trying to solve another visual pattern recognition task at the same time. Not trivial, right? So before we, we poo-poo the experiment and say, oh, this is, this is kind of easy, the robot should easily be able to do it, not so easy. The difference between the ellipsoid and the sphere is not that different. Hard to actually see the difference. Uh, again, I think there's a little bit of aspect, aspect ratio stuff going on in the video, so we're making things even harder on you. But actually, in most of these cases, the robot is doing the right thing. You can see for a while it's uncertain, and then it makes its decision. I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture that the robot is evolving to perform active categorical perception, which is the, the, the behavior by which the agent chooses a particular way to interact with its environment, to minimize within category differences, and maximize across category differences. Tell me about the strategy it came up with. Remember, this, this robot can manipulate this object in lots of different ways. This is what it came up with. If I blindfolded you and put these objects in front of you, is this what you would do? Again, thinking about thinking is misleading, right? It's, it's very, I've watched this video hundreds of times. It's very hard to see the differences in its interaction with these objects, but there, there is a difference. It's just not very, uh, not very extreme. Okay, let's look at the second video. So same C tier and N, but we're going to uh, start in an initial, a different initial configuration. Tell me about this case. Same C to an N, different initial position. It looks like it's trying to roll it backwards and then lift it back up to see if it rolls back the same way. Maybe that it rolls it back and then maybe rolls it forward again in some of the cases. What else is going on here that's different from the video you just saw? Uh, most of the cases it's saying ellipse. Uh, that could be, maybe there's a bias towards it choosing ellipse. And then sometimes it, yes. It has its thumb under it, right? That's kind of interesting. I don't know how useful that is or relevant to the decision-making process, but maybe. It's not as sure as it was before, right? How do you know that it's less certain in these eight cases? You, if you go back and watch the video, you'll see the blue arrow flicking around, right? I don't know, I don't know, it's the ellipsoid. No, wait a second, I'm not sure it's the sphere. I'm sure it's the sphere. What does that mean, again, in terms of the neural dynamics of neurons 47 and 48? What is causing that flickering? What's that? Uh, the area of intersection is much higher. It, it's actually, the CS and CD do not change during these 16 trials. They're already set in stone by the 16 trials the robot has already seen. So it's not that the boxes are changing. Could be, like the trajectory, Could be that in the, in the previous video that the, uh, that, or sorry, in this, this case, that the trajectory is more likely to be near the intersection. 
Could be, right? Or it wanders outside of both boxes. I don't know. Wanders back into CS. It's the sphere. Wanders into D. No, 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 no. It's the ellipsoid, right? It can change, quote unquote, change its mind as it's interacting with the object. Okay, so uh, we're, we've got 10 minutes left, so let's finish off this lecture by looking at uh, some, uh, some interesting aspects of this experiment. They ran evolution three times, so they evolved populations of CTRNNs three times, and we watch the fitness score over time, and eventually it climbs from around zero to two. Remember we have F1 and F2, an F1 of one, you're doing the right thing, you're keeping your hand on the sphere. And an F2 of one means there is no overlap between the two bounding boxes. Okay. You've probably already experienced this for those of you that have moved on to the evolutionary algorithms part of the assignments. If you run the evolutionary algorithm multiple times, regardless of whether it's the hill climber or the genetic algorithm, you get different results, right? can be an advantage and a disadvantage. You can see in the case of run number two here, it's quite a while for evolution to evolve a CTRNN that could successfully categorize these objects. But in all three cases, at the end, it has a CS and CD that are non-overlapping. Here's a picture of uh, the very best CTRNN that they evolved. So we're diving now into the brain of the robot, and we can see in pretty fine detail what this robot was thinking while it was interacting with some objects. Again, one of the advantages of doing evolutionary robotics, we can evolve it and then in some cases, if we set up the encoding in the right way, the way that the brain is built, we can interpret what's going on inside it. A lot of cases that's not the case, but in this case we can. During evolution, the robot was exposed to only uh, four rotations of the ellipsoid and four rotations of the sphere. They played back the best evolved controller and they wanted to see how well it does in general. So they took the ellipsoid and exposed it to 180 different orientations. And then they did the same thing with the sphere, 180 quote unquote rotations of the sphere. And this is what we get. The dashed line is C sub S, and uh, the dashed gray line is C sub S, and the dashed black line is C sub D. What is the robot thinking? Generally speaking. Well, it's like it's easier for it to tell with the sphere. Ah, uh, why? It's tighter. So the bounding box around the spheres is smaller than the bounding box around, the, uh, around C sub D. In other C turn ends, that generally is also the case. Why do you think that's the case? Again, we didn't select for anything to do with the sizes of the bounding boxes, but generally if you quote unquote ask the robot, it'll tell you C sub D is bigger than C sub S. What does that mean? Or why does that happen? Exactly, right? So there is now some geometry of these two objects that is starting to flow into the robot's mental experience of these objects. When it grasps the ellipsoid and does what it does, it tends to generate more different sensor values, bigger changes in the angles of its fingers and thumb than it does when it grasps the sphere. There's no overlap between these boxes, so that's a good thing. And remember that the small boxes inside are created by one experience with one object. In the case of the sphere, uh, uh, in the case of the sphere, you see that there are these two clouds of smaller boxes inside. Why? Exactly. So we expose the robot to these 180 rotations in A and B, but you would expect that that would lead to. I don't know what this is here, 90 of the boxes all perfectly overlapping one another in position A, and the other 180, uh, or the other 90 boxes all perfectly overlapping one another in position B. They're not overlapping. 
There's one small detail of the experiment that I haven't mentioned yet that's causing these boxes to not quite overlap. Even when we're placing exactly the same object in the same orientation with the same initial position of the arm. What is that detail? Uh, could be, could be they also put the object in exactly the same position. Most of you when you come to class tend to sit in the same seat you sat, on, sat in on Tuesday. You may not consciously be trying to do it, but most of the time you kind of sit down in the same way. But if we were to look, if I was to record with EEG or EMG the actual values of you know, the, sensor, the sense organs in your body as you did that, you'd never get exactly the same reading, right? Heraclitus told us 2,000 years ago, man never enters the same river twice. The investigators just put a little bit, they sprinkled a little bit of noise on the sensors and the motors, which is a common trick because again, ultimately we want to put this in physical machines that have to deal with the real world, which is never the same twice. So we can simulate that by just putting a little bit of, of noise out there. Okay. Here's a couple of other bounding boxes from different, uh, from different CTRNNs who generally tend to get the same sort of thing, non-overlapping boxes. We've got four minutes left. Let us mentally redo this entire experiment in four minutes. We're going to now expose the robots to spheres, ellipsoids, and cubes. And the robot has to tell us which of these three objects it's in contact with. What changes do we need to make? This, picture, this is probably most helpful to you. We're going to challenge the robot to do something slightly more difficult. We need another ah, we could add neuron 49, right? Which would seem the obvious thing to do. Do we need to? That's the whole point of all of this additional machinery. If we add in a third category, we don't need to add another categorization neuron. Why not? It'll have its own bounding box. When we put it, when we expose it to the cube, we're going to create C sub, C sub U for cube, right? It's a third bounding box. We're going to alter the fitness function in what way? Now what do, we, what, do we, what do we need to ensure about these three bounding boxes? Neither of them overlap, right? So we take all pairwise intersections and try and evolve them to be zero. We want three non-overlapping bounding boxes in here. And if we can evolve a CTRN that does that, that robot can tell us the difference between spheres, ellipsoids, and cubes, and barbells, and whatever other shapes you can emit, cones, right? We could keep going. How far could we go? How many different kinds of objects could this robot evolve the ability to distinguish between? Maybe. You could, add you could add. We could add dimensions. We could give up and add a, a third neuron if we wanted. But we could try and tile the plane. Let's go back to the three, ca uh, three categories uh, with a cube. If we were just to evolve uh, those three bounding boxes to be non-overlapping, remember we're not saying anything about the, the position or size of these bounding boxes. Where do you think these bounding boxes would end up? Like we saw before, there tends to be a bias here where the ellipsoid bounding box tends to be bigger than the sphere bounding box. What else might be true as a side effect of the very nature of spheres and ellipsoids and cubes? Why? It doesn't rule, maybe. Right, so there's probably going to be very different interactions with the cube, which is going to result in what happening in this two-dimensional space? There's no rectangles. Cubes, ellipsoids, and spheres? 
Maybe. Maybe there's more overlap between the cube and the ellipsoid. I don't think so. The sphere and the ellipsoid, because they're kind of interacting the same way, would probably be put together as a cube and the ellipsoid, too. So assuming we can get the robot to evolve non-overlapping pairs in the bounding boxes, the robot might also already be evolving an additional ability, which is to describe the, nat the relative nature of these objects. If we were to ask the robot, sphere, ellipsoid, and cube, which doesn't belong, it would probably, quote unquote, point at the cube. It would say, my sensor motor experience with the cube produces a bounding box way down here. The, the distance between these two bounding boxes is closer than the distance between these two. So to me, to the robot, cube is more different from ellipsoid and sphere. Uh, not necessarily, right? If, no, if none of the three bounding boxes are overlapping, then any point that falls outside those bounding boxes, the robot says, it's not an ellipsoid, it's not a sphere, and it's not a cube. I don't know what it is, but it's something else. Think on what else the robot might be able to infer about the relative features of these three objects. Uh, you're working on assignment 5, 9, and 10, or 9 and 10. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you.